what was one of the biggest problems facing people in cities in the 1890s? The answer is horses. Cities around the world had grown so much over the past hundred years and populations were pushing through the roof and the technology of the times was scaling as best it could just to try and keep up. Horses and horse-drawn carriages were the way people got around in cities in those days and they were scaling too. As a result, there were more horses in cities than anybody ever imagined. New York City alone was creating two million pounds of manure every day with no real way to get rid of it. It was piling up in the streets, there were flies everywhere, the smells were horrendous, and as you can imagine, there were real health concerns. There were also 40 horses dropping dead in the streets every day and there was no way to get rid of them. The owners would just walk away and leave them there to rot and the kids would play with them. So <laughs> this was the major concern, the health concern in the 1890s. Against this backdrop of cities on the brink of failure, uh, a technology that people had been playing around with for about 30 years started to get traction and take off. And it didn't work very well at first. It was hard to get started, or hard to drive, hard to you know, get fuel for, but it was cheaper than horses, all told, and it was a lot easier for, them, for people to use. And with those two things, the car took action, took, took hold, and took off. Within 30 years, it had pretty much transformed our cities. The problem of manure and horses was long gone. Uh, so cars, when they came into being at the turn of the century, they were a disruptive innovation, and they, they beat horses by being cheaper and easier to use. And in doing so, they were a, an environmental godsend at the time. It seems crazy to think that way now, but they solved this problem, and they allowed cities to scale for the next 100 years and, and grow to the size they were growing to anyway. So it's interesting to think about what would have happened if cars hadn't been invented. You know, what kind of innovations would people have come up with to get around this problem of manure? Uh, you can imagine that there might have been something like the low manure horse. <laughs> There's a horse that makes 30% less manure. We've, we've bred it. There might have been the big horse. This horse makes maybe a little more manure, but it can pull more people, so you don't need quite as many. There might have been the small horse. You know, this horse can't pull as heavy loads, but it makes less manure. And then there might have been the odorless horse, just a, a cosmetic fix. It doesn't make less manure, but the manure doesn't smell. And of course, none of these <laughs> solutions would have really been solutions, would they? It would have been band-aids to the problem. And of course, we didn't need to really go there because we got the car, and it solved the problem. And it seems funny to think about a world with big horses and small horses and odorless horses, and, but really, it's a lot like the world we're living in today. Today, once again, we're at this crossroads in cities everywhere. There's all these challenges. Uh, how do we scale? How do we continue to thrive and not collapse? And a lot of the solutions that people are proposing are big horses, small horses, odorless horses. And you have to ask yourself, do we want better kinds of horses or do we want an entirely new kind of ride? So I'm an innovator and I'm an entrepreneur. I know everybody's an innovator and entrepreneur these days. Uh, I'm one too. And I think a lot about cities. Uh, and Increasingly, I'm thinking about innovation in terms of disruptive innovation versus sustaining innovation. Disruptive innovation, as you probably all know here tonight, uh, is innovation that breaks with the past and it overturns the status quo. And it does it by being cheaper than what came before. Uh, what's interesting is that it's not necessarily better than what came before. Oftentimes, it's a little bit worse and that's part of the bargain, is that you take something that's a little bit worse and it's a lot cheaper and it's a, a great deal. Sustaining innovation, by contrast, is what we think of when we think of innovation. It's, it's bigger, better, faster, uh, roomier, safer, more efficient, sexier, all those things. It also generally costs more. So you think, you know, we're in the city, we're dealing with all these new innovations, and we have these options open to us always. Do we want disruptive innovations? Do we want sustaining innovations? Do we want bigger, better, faster? Or do we want cheaper and simpler? And this is what I think about a lot, and uh, I think about it in my life, in my day. I'll take you through some examples here. Uh, my apartment. I love my apartment. It's great. It's a thousand square feet. It costs me $3,100 a month, and it's not big enough for me anymore. I need a bigger apartment. Uh, conventional market, housing market wisdom would say, get a bigger apartment, get a 2,000 square foot apartment, pay $5,000 a month. What I want to do for people is I want to offer them smaller apartments. I want to offer a 250 square foot apartment tied to a 1,500 square foot atrium that you share with five other people. So you get this gigantic semi-private space with a very small, totally private space, and it brings the cost down with square feet to 
$2,250, something around there. Uh, that would be a great way to go smaller, cheaper, rather than bigger, better, faster. Uh, would you give up some things? Yeah, you'd give up a little bit. Would you do that for $1,000 less in rent? I certainly would. My air conditioner. I think about my air conditioner constantly from June to October. Um, <laughs> I've got one air conditioner in my apartment. It doesn't cool my entire apartment. And it costs me about $100 to $150 a month to run full time. So my wife and I talk about getting two air conditioners. That wouldn't really do the job. We talk about getting three air conditioners. The cost, maybe $400 a month. But I think about it, I think, do I really need that much air conditioner? I mean, look, it's, it's cooling the air up there, and it's cooling the air up there, and it's cooling the air up there. Do I need that air cooled? No. What I need is the air against my skin cooled. What I need is a cool shirt, something that just cools the air around you. <laughs> $400 a month? No. Cost, $10 a month. Get that. Be cool. Turn off your air conditioner. Keep it in your window for when grandma comes over, because she's not going to buy a cool shirt. Um, <laughs> I better keep going here because I'm short on time already. Uh, restaurant that I eat in for lunch every day. Uh, cost me $15 plus tip to eat there. I want to invent, oh wait, somebody already invented this. Uh, <laughs> food trucks. <laughs> but I think that this is a gigantically disruptive movement that nobody's really caught on to yet, how disruptive this is going to be because it's really rethinking space and, and getting rid of trimming all the fat off of these spaces in our cities. And you can uh, offer food for for half the price that you're offering it in restaurants. And I think that's going to really continue and, and continue to disrupt cities. So with all these things in our life, I mean, I could go on and on. If I had two hours, I could go on. But uh, you have to make a choice. Bigger, better, faster, or cheaper, simpler? Which way do we go? What does the future hold? Which way is going to lead to you know, our best individual futures and society future? A lot of people, you see a lot of this in the media. You know, this is the future. Uh, the future is bigger, it's really cool, it's really sexy. And the reason why you see this is because this is what people are selling. This is basically, people are selling last year's model of whatever product they sell with $5,000 of new stuff on it. And that's how they make money. Uh, that's what you see as the future. I think the future looks a lot more like this, whatever the, the 2012 version of this is. It's simple, it's cheap, it gets the job done. Uh, one of my favorite movie titles of all time, uh, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, a documentary from the 1990s. When it came out, I'm pretty sure that almost everybody took that to mean to be a slam against humanity, meaning that they were like just barely better than, than microorganisms. I look at that and I think, right on, that's what people need to be. People need to be fast, cheap, and out of control. They need to be quickly finding the fastest, cheapest solutions possible, going in every direction. Why? Because the alternative to fast, cheap, and out of control is slow, expensive, and in control. <laughs> and that's the path to failure. So we're at this crossroads in cities. We're on the brink of several different possible collapses. I really think that the next 100 years could be a golden age of cities uh, with just the most interesting things going on that you've ever seen. But it's not going to be bigger, better, faster. It's going to be totally different than what you've ever seen before. It's going to be fast. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be out of control. Thanks. <laughs>